Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today is Cameron Crawford. She is a care home placement expert, a long distance caregiver, and we're going to talk a little bit about both of those topics but we're also mostly going to focus on encouraging caregivers today. So thank you for joining me, Cameron. Thank you for having me. So So why don't you give the listeners your bio so that I don't mess it all up? (laughs) Sure. My name is Cameron Crawford. I live in Colorado, right outside Denver. Um, My mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's about 12 years ago. Um, I'm very much the sandwich generation. I remember When I got the phone call that we thought she might have Alzheimer's, I was at my preschooler's soccer game. And so I'm coming from both ends and realize, in fact, I call it more of a panini press than a sandwich (laughs) generation because it's a lot of pressure on both sides. I literally cried the first four years. Um, I was just devastated. I adore my mom. She's this beautiful steel magnolia from Texas. (laughs) <laughs> and um, I would fly down every six to eight weeks and just kind of help out going to doctor's appointments, um, helping get processes in place, um, help hire caregivers, or she would fly up and stay with me for six or eight weeks. And uh, and I was just sad. I was sad. I would look at my other friends and no one else was going through the same thing um, because my mom was pretty young when she was diagnosed. And I would just totally have mom envy Um, or I would hear somebody's mom flying in to help with the kids. And I just thought, my mom can't do that. I have no expectation for my mom. All I can do is help her. After a while, uh, I kind of became the go-to person for my friends when their parents started entering the stage. Um, And then when my mom had a really big decline My dad considered moving her up here to live in a community closer to me. Um, And so the first thing I did was kind of went online and got some information about um, different places around me. And I was referred to a place that um, I knew didn't have a great reputation. Mm. And I just wondered why anybody would refer me to them. And uh, when I asked you know, why? They said, well, I I don't know. I've never been in there. I just have, you know, and I'm like, well, I could have done a Google search of assisted livings by me. Um, but I wish I had somebody walking beside me that actually knew what's going on, knew the owners, knew the care history. Um, and so I, that became kind of my thing is to, um, stop crying, put on my big girl panties and do something that, that can help others. Um, And so I started a company that would help people find appropriate memory care and assisted livings and independent senior living for their parents. While doing that, I just, I just have a huge heart for other caregivers because it's hard. I didn't feel like I had anybody to ask questions to, and I would ask my friend's parents questions because they were going through the same things, but I didn't have any friends that were going through this. So I started a private Facebook group. That is um, just an encouragement for local family caregivers. Its whole purpose is to um, encourage, educate, and connect other caregivers called the Aging Parent Tribe. And it has become this lovely community of people um, who encourage each other, who know, you know, we know a lot of each other's stories. Um, You know, it started out really small and it's grown to about 600 people, which isn't huge, but I don't want it to be huge. I want it to be local people that need to be there that are other caregivers. Um, I have some other professionals on there that can answer questions about hospice and home care and a lawyer, um, but all of them know that our roles are to support the caregivers and not to promote our own business. So um, that's been a, a real joy and a great way for me to kind of just connect with other people, share what I know, and then to ask questions too. I don't know all the answers. So (laughs) I'll, I'll put on there like, Oh, my mom has some strange rash around her eye. What do I do? And five different people give me suggestions of things I should think about or talk about or look at. And 
it's been very helpful. So, so anyway, so that's me. I live in Denver. I have uh, three kids in high school and one in college. And um, I'm right there in between, you know, watching out for my kids and hopefully launching them, but also um, caregiving now long distance for my mom. So is, do you have siblings? I do. And that's, I have two brothers that live in Texas, close to my parents. And that has been a really neat story about how we've all kind of learned to figure out our roles in caregiving. At the beginning, I was like the all in. Um, that was my, I'm the only daughter. And I say, you know, in most families, the daughter gets the china and the mom. That's our job. Yeah, that's and, true. Uh, <laughs> and I want the white china and they don't care about it. But um, after a while, when, one of my brothers lives with them. And so we've all evolved in our roles. And within the past three years, we've all kind of settled into sharing roles and trusting each other and communicating well um, and uh, working together to to do the best for caregiving. But that was a little tricky at first. It took a while. <laughs> and how did you guys kind of go about that? Because that's unfortunately not the norm. Which is yeah. Well, we argued a lot at first. Seriously, we argued. Um, there were a lot of tears, not all from me. We all cried at some point, I think. And I think we one of the big conversations that we had recently was that we just need to trust each other and that we always expect that the other person has the um, is doing the best that they can. And some of us can invest more time. Some of us are more hands-on. Some of us do the background work. Um, I handle all like calling the doctors and hospice and handling that because that's kind of my realm. Um, but my brother's there. So he's doing a lot of hands-on things. Um, and so, and even, you know, right now I, I made a call about something that one of my brothers didn't agree with. And uh, I said, you know, remember, we're all going to trust each other here. We're going to trust we're doing the right thing and we're going to have a lot of grace and we're in this together. And um, so it it's worked out. I feel like after 12 years, we have finally gotten it down and uh, are working well together. But it was um, we argued a lot and we didn't trust each other a lot. And we wondered why people were making decisions or we wanted control. Yeah. Control was probably the big thing. Um, and just realizing that we, you know, we can do anything, but we can't do everything. So you need to have a team working together and we work a lot better as a group, but took a lot of conversations to get to that. Yeah. My sister and I never got to that point. Mm -hmm. There was never a lot of trust before. Mm -hmm. And for a while after, while well, our dad was in the hospital for a month and then he was on hospice. And then for probably the first year, mom was in the memory care. Mm -hmm. We were, you know, at first I would go visit mom and give her, my sister, the feedback on what happened. And then, and she would do the same thing. And after a while, it got to the point where it was like, you know, it was just a normal visit, nothing, you know, of import happened. So, mm -hmm. you know, I probably didn't text her and that might have, I probably should have texted her and said, you know, I'll just let you know if something important happens. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think I aired possibly in the wrong direction on trying not to overwhelm with information that was unnecessary. And I think right. it might've looked like not communicating mm -hmm. because the, you know, the trust level wasn't there. So, you know, you guys have you had know, 12 years to work on it. We only had well, three. And a couple of the practical things we did, because your point is really good is um, every email we send now, we copy everyone on it. And then we have a, a shared Google document that has all the information in it. Um, so it has um, all the doctor's information, all the care routines, any meds. And then when we do phone calls, we do a, um, a Zoom or a conference call so that we over communicate. So we have, we didn't communicate very well at the beginning. And just this year, we've started over communicating and that's helped a lot. Hmm. That's good to know because mm -hmm. I think because you're not there in Texas with your parents mm -hmm. as the only daughter that might've mm -hmm. helped prevent you from being the 
primary everything, which ends up happening. Right. And in our family, and this is not just my sister and I, or just our immediate family, but like, it seems to be the both sides, both parents side of the family, like we have control freak syndrome, something fierce. Mm -hmm. I have that. I have that disease. (laughs) I mean, I've learned to control it Mm because my husband's an only child and I had to deal with my sister. And, you know, sometimes it's just like, you just have to understand that you want to do it your way and you think your way is best and they want to do it their way and they think their way is best. And you know what? You just want the best for the person you're caring for. So maybe just just Mm -hmm. release your need to do it your way. Yes. You know, let them prove their way is not right. So that was, that was always my theory. And everybody approaches things differently. Like I said, my sister still has school age kids and Mm -hmm. you know, it's just, I think she probably, like, I think she probably felt seriously panini. Her in-laws live with them and have mm-hmm. for 13 years. Mm-hmm. Yes. 13 years or 14, 14 mm-hmm. years now. Wow. And they didn't expect the in-laws to live that long. So mm-hmm. it's typical caregiving that, you know, it always ends up longer than you think it's going to. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. um, they don't need hands-on care. It's mm-hmm. just, they were poor and not in great health. Mm-hmm. So, you know, she's got them and, you know, so they're the, they've had their kids as long as they've had his parents. So it's just like, wow. it's a lot. Yeah. And, you know, and then we have to deal with my mom. So, you know, I think my sister seriously got panini. I, I like that term a lot. <laughs> well, and I had someone at the beginning when I was doing most of it, And I was kind of complaining. I'm like, oh my gosh, why am I doing everything? And someone said, you know, when other people are involved, their opinion starts to matter and you have to listen to their opinion. So do you want other people's opinions or do you just want to do what you think is right? And I'm like, well, of course I want to do what I think is right. And (laughs) they said, okay, then be thankful that you're the only one doing this because you don't have to listen to anybody else's opinion. And so I... That actually kind of worked and relieved me at the beginning. And then when we all started working together, you know, there were a a lot of advantages to that too, because, and we take turns, who's going to be the bad guy. Um, Since I'm long distance, I don't, I can be the bad guy and I'm not in the same town as people. And um, you're not in the line of fire. (laughs) Yeah. So I volunteer to do a lot of the dirty work because my brothers have to do a lot of hands-on work. Um, so I don't know, we just kind of balance who's good at what and try to let the person that's good at it handle it. But it's tricky. Co- family's totally complicated. Very that is complicated. very true. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's just personalities don't help. <laughs> yeah. So you got a phone call that said, oh, we think mom might have Alzheimer's. We ended up at my parents' house the Tuesday after Thanksgiving 2016 and realized that my dad thought it was 1998 and my mom already had Alzheimer's. So it was like, Holy crap, Mm -hmm. what's going on? So we Mm -hmm. were literally dropped off a cliff into having to figure Mm -hmm. out what the heck to do. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, most people, they end up caregivers like that. It's like one, Mm -hmm. I think a lot of one guest of mine basically referred to it as that Tuesday afternoon phone call. That none of us right. want to get. I can see that. Yeah. Like, I think culturally, we don't want to think about becoming old and frail and needing help when 70% of us will need care mm-hmm. before we die. And mm-hmm. don't think that you're going to end up in the 30% because the 30% doesn't usually end up needing care because they're gone. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> it's like mm-hmm. this plan that you're going to need care. But what mm-hmm. advice do you have for those who suddenly find themselves torn between their life and the needs of a loved one, like your mom or my mom, mm-hmm. or, you know, like when you get that Tuesday afternoon phone call, right. you said you spent what, three years crying. Mm-hmm. So how do we, how do we avoid that? <laughs> and I think that um, when I talk to people, the very first few years, I think, are the hardest ones because all of a sudden you're normal and all of your expectations are different. Your parents, the roles all of a sudden switch. And like you said, you're all of a sudden trying to scramble and figure out what's 
what to do next. And you just have no idea because people learn before you have a kid, people give you books, you go to classes and you're preparing yourself when all of a sudden your parent needs care or something's changed. You don't know unless you just happen to be a social worker or have some type of background, um, which most of us don't. So the very first thing I think is finding a community of people to support you, whether that's, I remember going to the, my first Alzheimer's meeting and (laughs) my mom was, she was so mild to Alzheimer's at the time. And I was like, and I was super young and I, everybody else there is in their seventies and (laughs) it wasn't a great fit, but I tried, I was trying to find people somewhere to connect with. Um, right now, I think it's so much easier because there's so many virtual options. There's a lot of Facebook options. Um, there's a lot of community options. And so I think you need to find people that know what you're talking about and where you are. Um, when I would go stay with my mom, I'd say it was, it was like being in the twilight zone because everything in the world, it moves so slowly and we're watching the Hallmark channel all day long. And it's just a totally different world and people don't understand it unless they're caregivers. And so um, finding another caregiver support group um, is is just really key. So at least people understand what you're going through. I agree. And I would have relished having you in my support group because I was the youngest unless somebody brought one of their adult children with them. And I was also the person who's loved one had had Alzheimer's the longest. So I was like, wow. I, I win the prize, right. <laughs> or the booby prize maybe. And it was yeah. fine. You know, I never felt out of place. My mom at that point was very advanced mm-hmm. and I was kind of like, why did I not think of Googling for a support group for this before? Mm-hmm. My dad did most of the, the work and he didn't accept help from my sister and I, mm-hmm. she did eventually start I think on a monthly basis, throwing together crock pot meals that were, you know, like freezer mm-hmm. bag. And so he would just throw them in the crock pot and, and go, he was a horrible cook. And obviously my mom couldn't, <laughs> couldn't manage making a sandwich anymore. And that was how she helped. And, but he resisted everything I tried to do. Like I mm-hmm. researched the adult, an adult day program. The one that was closest to them mm-hmm. was like way across town you had to pass multiple schools, mm-hmm. including the community college. And I don't know if it was him that had problems in the morning or her, but he mm-hmm. was just completely resistant to the idea. He wouldn't even go look at it. And I knew it would benefit both of them. I'm like, you know, in, right. in the back of my head, I was thinking, well, the hell with if it's best for her, you need this. And he was just like, not mm-hmm. interested. And I kind of, at that point, physically checked out because I'm like, if you're just going to keep fighting me on help, then I'm just going to do what I need to do. And so then we ended up, like I said, dropped off the cliff when his mind went back to 1998. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That was not a lovely day. Mm -hmm. Um, So I ended up finding the support group because I went to one grief support group after he passed away. Again, being one of the super youngest people there. And Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get over my dad. And my mom is referring to him as her husband. And it was just, it was just, I'm like, the grief over losing him is one thing, but dealing with her is this whole other thing. And these people, right? they have no clue. And so I went home and I Googled like Alzheimer's support group and found it. And I've been in it. I've missed two meetings in three years. One is because wow. yeah, they're virtual and I was out walking the dog and I looked at my watch and I went, oops. <laughs> I'm like, and I don't have a strong enough internet signal to, to like log in with my phone. So, and I got chastised for missing it. Right. Well, they're wondering where you were. Well, and that's the thing. They become your people. And so with my Facebook group, I, I keep it private because I don't want anybody to be able to see everybody's private stuff. I want it to be a safe place for people to be able to talk and share and share family stories, share mom stories without having that be public knowledge. But, uh, you know, I was out riding my bike on a trail and someone was coming this way and I'm like, Sam, you're Sam, you're on my group. And he's like, oh my gosh. And it was like, so, and when I, and a lot of those people have actually become clients of mine that I've helped 
find placement for. And when we meet, it's like meeting an old friend because we have shared these stories together. And I, I know that your mom fell and broke her hip. And so you just need people that understand and that know more than you do. Because even though I feel like I know a lot, I didn't know that there was a course program 30 minutes from my house for people with Alzheimer's, but someone in that group did. Or I didn't know there is a um, an Alzheimer croquet group in the middle of Denver that pairs um, school age kids with people with Alzheimer's. Oh, that but, sounds so fun. So fun. Such a great idea. And so you start mixing with these people and everybody has different experiences and those different resources. And it just opens up the, you know, your Alzheimer's world a little bit more and with a lot of really positive things. So well, being, it's being huge. a smaller group, I did, I did answer the question. So you have to like, let me into your group, <laughs> but that was earlier today. So you've been busy. Mm -hmm. I'll um, think about it. I, <laughs> one of my issues with a lot of those Facebook groups is it, well, I see people who ask questions that it's like, oh my gosh, these people need a lot more education and they'll get like 400 responses. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I try to scroll through like one person was asking about, um, is it normal for somebody with Alzheimer's to only want to eat like junk food? Mm -hmm. and I'm like, yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple reasons for it. And there was like 308 responses and a lot of it. Wow. It was insane. I'm like, who right. even reads that after a while, you know, and somebody, I just, I find a lot of those things to be more like, you know, you can do it. You don't need to put your loved one in a, in a home. And, and, you know, it's just, I almost feel like right. the encouragement ends up in a negative position, which I don't right. know if that makes sense, but it's like, I have looked in on them for two years <clears throat> and they drive, I'm mm -hmm. not a huge Facebook fan. That's one of my problems, but I think <laughs> like our um, support group is next week. And so I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, if we just had a group Facebook for, the people that are in my support group and maybe other people that are like close by, like mm -hmm. just in our town, that might actually be really beneficial. Well, so and even things like giving away equipment, um, someone had a sit to stand, which are these amazing lifts that um, they're not as, um, it's not like a Hoyer lift where you're lifting somebody up, but um, it was one of our Facebook people whose parents had um, ALS. Mm. And they were able to use that almost up until the last month of her life. Wow. And um, when her mom passed away, she has this amazing piece of equipment. We were able to give it away. We've given away hospital beds and walkers. And if somebody has a need, they can go on there and ask. But yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way. But having it smaller, which is kind of how I like it, it just it makes it a lot more personal and not overwhelming. Yeah. Well, when you let me in, I'm in, I'm interested in looking so that I can maybe we have maybe some start people that, that with, aren't local. Well, that like I'm not local, but is local. But we'll let you in. You're in. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. So you well, you talked about a little bit how like at the beginning you you did everything for one reason or another. Maybe it was because you just maybe because your control freak disease was control not in remission. <laughs> So, but I, I have talked to people who, you know, it's like, oh, mom needs, you know, she can't really drive anymore. So let me take her to the doctor. And the next thing they know, you know, they've, they've over the years, they've started mm -hmm. doing all this stuff. And one day they wake up, they're exhausted, they're burned out and they, mm -hmm. they just, they're overwhelmed. And yet the person that they're taking care of needs more and more of them. Mm -hmm. And so how, mm -hmm. how do you. How do you think we can help families that find themselves in that position where they, they feel like they're drowning and they don't feel like there's any life preserver anywhere? Mm -hmm. And then I have a part B to that question, but let's, we'll, we'll answer them one at a time. <laughs> um, so it's a hard question because it's so true. I recently told someone, uh, and I don't put myself in the same category as somebody that's taking care of the mom at the house right now, because that's a whole nother ball game. But I said, you know, right now, my focus is so narrow of what I can and can't do. And so my, even though I work, I own a company, I have kids, 
my goal every morning is I want to wake up. I want to um, sit by my fire pit outside with a glass of tea, even if it's just for a few minutes with a blanket. Yeah. Um, I have a little devotional that helps to like kind of calm me and keep me focused and um, help me not to go to the stress areas. Um, and then I want to walk my dog. And so I kind of set up in my mind what were goals for me that I knew helped set me up to have a better day and to be able to handle all the stressful things that are coming because they're going to come. You can't avoid them. That's true. And so um, you kind of have to see how you have to be healthy so that you can approach them in a healthy way and calmly because it's so much, it's so easy to go the other way. Yeah. Um, so I made a list of these things that were important for me to do every day. And I'm like, even if the rest of the day gets blown away, which it usually does, something changes or comes up or there's an emergency. Um, at least I've had some time in the day to balance it and to focus. Um, I would say whenever I post that on my Facebook group, almost everybody says walk their dog. So I don't know <laughs> what that is. So everybody should have a dog. <laughs> But there is something about getting outside and walking, even around just the block. It just changes your whole perspective. I think that's important. Um, I also think that the quote about that we can do anything, but we can't do everything and realizing that you have to have a team and sitting down and writing down a list of who should who is on your team, even if they're you're the major caregiver, you're doing 95 percent of the work and it's a lot on your shoulders, you need to look at who your team is, and you need to use them. So if you have, you know, a sibling that can come once a month, they should come once a month, and you should have it on the calendar. If you have one of their friends that offered to come sit with, you know, your mom for an hour, you need to, you need to build your team, and you need to ask for help, which is hard. And people don't like asking for help. But so it's easier when you write it down and you look at these and you realize it's a gift to a lot of these people to be able to help you too. They're getting something out of it. You're not always a burden. And so if you can use that and then finding any resource you can, whether it's, um, you know, I think adult daycare is amazing. We had some amazing programs in Denver. They're closed right now because of COVID, but, um, but figuring out what are the resources around you and how you can use them. So definitely do some Google searching. It's like, especially early on, mm -hmm. I know there's a gal that I know through social media. Her mom has Alzheimer's, her dad has dementia, and she has mm -hmm. a special needs sister. Oh, right. Wow. And a very unhelpful family to the extreme mm -hmm. as in she could, I mean, she has to fight them off. They're mm -hmm. only after mom and dad's money, which they don't have mm -hmm. very much of. They're in an, I believe, an assisted living community. Mm -hmm. And so she has to take care of like their medications and mm -hmm. they don't have like a med tech that, no, they do have a med tech that dispenses. But the bottom line is, is it doesn't like if it went her mom, well, I mean, not if, because we all go, but regardless, like if her dad dies, she still has her mom and her sister. If her mom, you know, it's like her sister's younger than she is. So it's, I mean, she just sees this, the rest of her life just being completely overwhelmed and trying to support everybody and just, oh yeah, yeah, it just, I don't, I think she needs to work on finding a team that's outside of the family because she almost needs a team to help fight them off. Absolutely. Well, and that's the thing that there's definitely times when having professional people is appropriate and um, and like, I would probably start out by calling your area of aging and asking for any resources they have Google. I say that and not just to tout placement people, but I feel like we're kind of like referral gurus, but like we just collect referrals and I would say home care companies probably do the same thing. And a lot of them are just really nice people, um, that are happy to share resources. And so I have, I would say I have people call me all the time and they're not ready to place their parent in assisted living, but I can give them a VA person to talk to. I can, so they can get some VA aid and attendance benefits. So they're, 
they didn't even realize that their dad might have money that can help pay for his care. Um, you know, I have a medic um, person that I send people. So at least they can talk to them about options or, um, you know, there's some grants for care in our area. So if you plug into somebody, they might be able to share that stuff with you. I might message her and see if she's done a couple of those things. She is in a less liberal state, shall mm -hmm. I say? And <laughs> the impression that I've gotten mm -hmm. is there's, I think it's hard. I'm, I'm trying to be careful how I word this, but it almost seems like culturally, it's mm -hmm. just expected that she will continue mm -hmm. running her company and take care of her sister and her mom and her dad and everything else. And mm -hmm. I guess her kids are like your kids age, you know, young, you know, twenties, mm -hmm. probably not older than too much older than late twenties. And, you know, it's just, they're just days that just, mm -hmm. you know, and she really needs to do something different. Her mom has really, really struggled because mm -hmm. of, she can't go, you know, she's had to use like an Amazon echo to talk her dad through helping her mom in a shower. I mean, her mom needs a lot more mm -hmm. support, but the money's not there mm -hmm. and the time is not there. And the being able to go in is just like, it's been, it's been too much. Right. <laughs> so yeah. how do we, so knowing that, you know, I mean, obviously hers is an extreme case, mm -hmm. but as I said before, 70% of us will need care before we go. Mm -hmm. My family, you know, it's like my husband's an only child. My sister and I are not close. My daughter's an only child. We've had conversations about expectations and I try to let people know, you know, I'm on the older end of Gen X. Mm -hmm. I let people know it's like, please don't ever say, I want to live in my home until I die. Mm -hmm. because that is just a burden that you put on your family that they may not be able to to do my mom oh, said that absolutely there's so and there's so much guilt that adult kids have on them well there's plenty of guilt anyway yeah um but then to have that on you is really hard um and we we kind of talked about i'm the worst placement person in the world because my mom's still at home but they're able to do that because they have full-time care which they play an incredible amount of money for. It would be way less expensive for her to be in assisted living. And uh, their house is all one level and my brother lives with them. So there just happens to be some things because she's extremely advanced Alzheimer's and we and she's on hospice. So we, mm. were, we um, put her on hospice three and a half years ago. Um, and so hospice, even though it doesn't take over caretaking, it supplements and it helps with showering. We wouldn't have been able to keep her home without hospice. So for us, that's worked. But on the flip side, you need to talk as a family and decide what are your, your, what's your limit. And those are things you should write down before you get to the limit, because you're always going to think you can do more or that you should do more. Um, and so what are your limits? Are you going to be able to handle showering? Um, my dad showered my mom or assisted her some at the beginning, but then when he broke his hip, mm. it's, he can't shower anymore. And, and part of it, I was also getting nervous that showering someone's hard. They're slippery and you're in a shower and they can fall. That's where most accidents happen. So is it safe? Can you, you know, so for us, showering was a big deal. We had to have that figured out. A lot of people, that's an, that's one of those things that they, that's going to make the decision if they need to go into assisted living. Can you, is there somebody that can handle their meds? If they're wandering and it's a safety issue like that, that's a game changer. My mom never wandered um, and she really doesn't walk anymore either. So um, we could stay at home, but when somebody leaves the house or uh, I have a friend who's, her mom went for a walk and she said, uh, about 30 minutes later, the husband who has Alzheimer's drove by in the car and waved at her. Oh, and no. I'm like, all right, that's, that's one of those um, triggers that you need to make a change. So decide, and it could look different for anybody. It could be, um, you know, in Colorado, about 40 hours of care ends up costing about the same as moving to assisted living. 
So once you go past 40 hours of care, is that your trigger that you need to, um, you know, look at moving someone to assisted living? And just being, writing those down because you're going to forget and you're going to feel guilty and all those emotions come into play. And that way you can look at it and say, nope, when I was saying six months ago and I wrote these things down and I wasn't feeling emotional, <laughs> these were the triggers that I said that we would look at. And then when you hit those triggers, you really need to consider it. Because my mom always said, well, I don't want to be a burden to you girls. I want to live in my home forever. Guess what? <laughs> Those are yeah. mutually exclusive. Right. And after my dad passed away, I mean, I, I felt terrible originally. Now my aunt took care of their mom and I will never understand how this decision became of the way it happened. My aunt stopped working to take care of their mom. So when my grandmother passed away, my aunt ended up on welfare. Mm hmm. Now, I know at the time my mom was already getting bad and my dad was a little bit ornery and probably went, I have to deal with this over here. You guys are on your own, which I don't really approve of that decision, but somehow the decision was not great. And so originally we were going to have my aunt move in with mom and we were going to get a caregiver like eight hours a day so that my aunt didn't have to deal with her sister full time because that wasn't right. My aunt is a... I think she's 11 years younger than my mom. So, you know, that's, that's pretty significant since my mom had younger onset Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and being a planner and I have to fight my very pessimistic negative tendencies. I sat down one day and said, okay, you know, my sister and I actually agreed on this. So I had to blow it up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I've sat down and said, what's like the worst case nuclear disaster that could happen my aunt does have a drinking problem mm -hmm. and I just started thinking about like, well, you know, obviously chances are my mom will go first and then we're going to have to basically house my aunt until she can go back on the, you know, section eight housing. And I'm like, you know, will she accept having somebody else live in the house with her to cover some of the expenses like the property taxes and the mm -hmm. gardener. And I mean, it wasn't a lot of expenses, but, you know, I, I, and so I, I went and looked at a assisted living community with the memory care. There was one literally a mile down the hill from my house. And I knew mm -hmm. that that wasn't a good one, which was a bummer mm -hmm. because it was a mile from my house mm -hmm. and it would have been better for my sister, but it wouldn't have been great for mom. And right. so I went to one, like the next one closest and they said she could keep her dog and I practically could not give them money fast enough. <laughs> I did Dogs not. are a big deal. Yeah. Well, and I, I laugh because I picked the place all fully on gut instinct. I mm -hmm. did not look at Google reviews. I did not talk to anybody. I just went, yep, this place looks good. We're done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't necessarily recommend that method, but gut instinct isn't <laughs> bad. Mm -hmm. Then I had to get my sister on board. She, and then our aunt said, no, we're, I'm not doing that. So thank God mm -hmm. she blew up that plan. So that mm -hmm. kind of let me off the hook. The day before we moved my mom, mm -hmm. my mom was going to come stay with me so that the next morning, like my husband and my brother-in-law could watch mom and my sister and I could set up her room as homey and as similar to her home as possible. She was leaning on the kitchen counter, looking out the window, kitchen window into her backyard. Now they had lived there almost 47 years mm -hmm. and we had basically told her that we there was things in the house that needed to be fixed, which was true. Mm -hmm. And after we got them fixed, she can move back. That was not true. Mm -hmm. She's leaning on the kitchen counter, looking out the window. And she goes, well, you're not selling my house. And I said, oh, no, 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 we're not selling your house. She whips around, looks at me with that mom look. We all know what that means. It's just, mm -hmm. and you're not renting it out either. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> I won't say anything. Oh yeah, that was <laughs> awful. So I went to my hair salon. I managed to slice both tires on my less than one year old car. I think it was eight months mm -hmm. old. Mm -hmm. So I had to have it, you know, flatbed trucked to the tire place. Oh no. <laughs> then I have my mom and her super obese poodle, which I mentioned to you about her earlier. Mm -hmm. And regular listeners know my mom's dog was like double her, a, 
<laughs> acceptable body weight, which made it very difficult for the dog to keep clean after using bathroom stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't know how when the doctor she went to the bathroom. So I've got this poodle, this huge fat poodle, my mom, her stuff, and the dog stinks because she's got stuff caked on her. And, it, and my mom was jumping every time the um, whatever they use to put the lug nuts on the car. It was like, it was horrible. <laughs> it was, it was horrible. horrible. Yeah, it was awful. It's, right. And I really, really, really wish my dad had like realized that the two of them needed to go to assisted living because mm-hmm. I think he would have been a lot happier and healthier longer. He had diabetes and other issues. But, you know, like I said earlier, the uh, control freak <laughs> syndrome did not go into remission with him. Right. It's, just, it's a challenge. And it was oh, it was awful. The first two months she lived there, she she acted like she was in prison. I'd show up and she'd burst into tears and, oh, thank God you're here. And, you know, mm-hmm. I, I've, I've been left here alone. And, oh, God, it was horrible. <laughs> it's just the worst. It is. It's hard. And I think a lot of times um, family members think once they go to memory care or assisted living, then they'll all be relieved. Um, <laughs> and it's not. It's, it changes everything. But what it does, it goes back to that team that you have. And so at least it's not all on your shoulders. Yeah. You're, you know, you're working with a team of people. And that's a, what amazes me is for one mom, you know, we have a team of, I well, five hospice people and three different caregivers and three, bro- I mean, our team is huge to take care of one person. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't solve all the problems when they move to assist living or memory care, but at least it helps to, to share the care with other people and the people that can specialize in something, you know, we have Agazine that gives my mom showers. I, I love Agazine. I, she, that is her job. That's her role. That's all she does is shower and get my mom dressed. And, um, and what a godsend that there's somebody that I can share that with because that's that takes time every single day. They have to get showered. They have to get dressed, and to be able to share that with somebody else just to release a little bit of your caregiver burden. Yeah, and like my mom was not open to being helped, so that there was one time. I think it was about oh boy, well it was back in 2019. It might have been even late 2018 where she was not changing clothes like literally every week when i went and saw her she's wearing the same sweater and i'm like it is 90 freaking degrees outside why are you wearing a sweater now it's a lightweight three-quarter length sleeve sweater you know um and i know old ladies get cold easily i get cold easily and i'm not really an old lady because my grandmother's 102 so age is relevant (laughs) (laughs) it's like you know compared to a two-year-old i'm old but compared to her i'm not so you know it's like (laughs) i always like to tell people that and i asked the caregiver if she was giving them trouble showering or no excuse me changing clothes and she's oh yeah and she doesn't want to shower and i was like oh that explains it because i had taken i we went out a lot to parks and pools and the library. We we liked, she liked, I did not. I liked to take her out where she could go watch kids. Mm -hmm. That made her happy and Mm -hmm. making her happy made me happy. So then I had taken her out the next morning. I get in my car to go in the gym. Like I said, these were in the old days when you could do Mm -hmm. those things. And I got my car and I'm like, my car smells like old lady nursing home. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and I and thankfully it was, you know, early, early fall, I believe, late summer. Mm-hmm. And so it was still nice. So I drove to the gym with all the windows and the sunroof open and mm-hmm. kind of aired out my car. So mm-hmm. when I saw them again and they're like, oh, yeah, she's giving us a hard time about that. I'm like, oh, that explains Yeah, it. she is. Actually, it must have been summer because we went to the pool and she only got in up to her knees. Mm-hmm. And. Then we sat on the edge and watched the children playing and splashing, which was fun. Oh, that's so fun. Oh, she loved it. And so when we got back, I thought, well, we got back a little earlier. They're they're a little behind on the dinner. And I'm like, do I dare? I've done, I didn't you know, I don't want to get into showering my mom, but I said, mm-hmm. Oh, you you wanted to shower real quick before dinner, wash off all the sand and gunk from the pool. 
Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I did. So I got her in the shower. Now they have the chairs. You know, uh-huh. she didn't need it because she walked up until she broke her leg. Mm-hmm. And I was really shouldn't have been surprised, but you couldn't even get hot hot water. You could only get like warmish warm water. So you couldn't uh-huh. even didn't have to worry about scalding because I was right. I thought about that. And I actually got her showered and I washed her hair and then I let her handle the towel and getting Mm -hmm. dressed. And I was like, okay, that wasn't so awful. But as, as she progressed in the Alzheimer's, she literally, I mean, she like scratched and drew blood on caregivers. Mm -hmm. And I thought there's no way in heavens I'm going to even attempt to do this again because I don't want that memory. And she did my, my husband's last encounter with her. We had to get her. She fell on Mm -hmm. New Year's, the December 30th, 19. And she, from that point forward, was having a lot of pain walking. And I kept telling them she fell. She had a lot of pain walking. You know, it doesn't take a brilliant doctor to figure these things out. Uh And they x-rayed her hips and they came back with, Mm -hmm. oh, well, she has arthritis. I'm like, arthritis does not flare up all at once. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm aware. And, Mm -hmm. you know, what, what it turned out was when she fell, she actually cracked her pelvis. Oh, oh. yeah. So, yeah, but I, I had to like trick her into getting the x-rays. She was all fine. She kind of nodded off while we waited and we didn't wait very long, like 10 minutes or so. It literally wasn't very Mm -hmm. long, but I think Mm -hmm. getting from the home to the, in the car. And I mean, just, that was a lot of effort. And then yeah. the pain. So I think she kind of just nodded off and mm-hmm. then she refused. And I was like, hell no, honey. <laughs> we drove all the way here. We're getting some extras. Well, and it's like, I had to rearrange my appointment for my mm-hmm. chiropractor. So yeah, you're not just throwing away my whole morning. Cause no. Mm-hmm. So I said, can you to sit in a wheelchair? I'm like, can you stand up for me? And she did. And I literally put my foot up next to hers and mm-hmm. pivoted her and just like plunked her onto the table. Mm-hmm. She was not appreciative of that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the x-ray technician realized like, you know, normally they like want to make sure everybody's protected and covered. And no, right. that woman got my mom in position and hit the button. I'm not even yeah. sure she was covered. I just got x-ray. It just with, yeah. It was like, she didn't even ask me if I cared before. Mm-hmm. I, and we got her x-rayed and then she wouldn't get off the table. That was mm-hmm. so funny. So my husband came to, you know, help because he was always good at sweet talking her. Oh, it did not work. She was oh. just pissed. <laughs> oh, she was so pissed. <laughs> and she's just like, I'm going to go back to my room. And she's like literally laying on the x-ray table like a corpse. And it it was just horrifically funny. Mm-hmm. And there's like literally half the staff's looking in the door going, oh, what's going on? Why is this little old lady screaming bloody murder and cursing? And it was just awful. And so wow. he, he reached out his hand to help her up and she just, she scratched so hard. She drew blood and he was like, Oh hell no. And he picked her up and plopped her in the chair. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's like, I'm not having this. So it got, you know, it's like, even though we had like things that worked that day, everything failed. I mean, the, this sweet, yeah. she was a bit of pediatric nurse. She couldn't sweet talk. My mom, my mom was beyond angry and was not getting up out of her chair or out off the table. So it was just insane. That was unfortunately his last encounter with my mom. It was not a good day for either of them, but one of the things that I've experienced doing this podcast and, and through social media and stuff is that there's a lot of caregivers that don't openly admit they want out, which, you know, there are days when we feel that way, but then we kind of regroup. And I think there's some people that are just so burned out you know, they've promised never to move a loved one to a care home, and that might not be a financial option, you know, but they need to regain a significant portion of their life. And then I find other caregivers keep telling them, oh, no, you can do it. You can do it. And they're trying to be positive. And this is a lot also on the other Facebook pages because yours sounds much better. <laughs> yeah. Shameless plug, right? <laughs> yes, it is so much better. So how do we help people who need to make a major change, except that it might actually be for the best for both of them? Mm -hmm. And how do we help them find an option to do that? 
Because I think some people just, they're just so overwhelmed with just the day-to-day care and, and yes. needs of their loved one that mm-hmm. the thought of getting on the computer or the phone or both and trying to find options is just like, oh, forget it. Mm-hmm. I'll, just, I'll just keep going until I die. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that is the, that is some of the unstated expressions that I've gotten from people that I know personally and through social oh, media. Yeah, it's overwhelming. Um, so I think using a local placement person is just huge. Um, I, I, a lot of times when I talk to people, I said, I'm kind of like the sister you wish you had. <laughs> so I'm going to be the sister that will take care of all of this. And I know you have a to-do list over here that includes doctor's appointments and 50 things on this list. I'm going to take this list over here and I'll handle all of the placement things. I'm going to do all the research for you. I've been to the majority of the places. With COVID, there's a couple of new places I haven't been to. But, um, you know, in Denver, there's 480 options for senior living. And um, how many? what's the population of Denver? In Denver. Yeah. How, what's the population? Oh, I don't know that. <laughs> um, it, that wasn't on my to know list. <laughs> But, um, you know, everything from small care homes to big places to, um, and you want to know somebody that knows all of the options, knows the pros and the cons of each one of them, and can narrow them down um, to three or four, and they'll be able to narrow it down to you uh, because of your budget, your loved one's care needs, and then um, budget care needs and desired location. Um, locations always that can change because the budget and the care needs are the most important two things. And then location is nice, but that's not a have to. Um, but what they'll do is they'll take all the options and they'll narrow them down for you. Uh, they'll set up the tours for you around your schedule, and then they should go on the tours with you. And people sometimes say, well, why do I need you to go on the tours? And I'm like, well, Because when you get in there, number one, everyone, all the salespeople are really nice. They all have very kind hearts. They all um, have great things to say about their communities. And so you start talking and you forget the questions that you had in the first place. Um, You forget maybe, maybe the placement person knows something that applies to your loved one and the salesperson doesn't know it. And so they can inject and say, oh, you know, your mom loves painting. Well, they have painting here every Thursday. Um, And so they can inject things like that. They can also help negotiate prices. Um, So it doesn't mean that you're going to get a huge discount necessarily, but they know what the deals are right then. Um, Sometimes if they have a relationship with them, they might be able to work with someone on negotiating on like community fees or, um, you know, a discount and you know it just can be helpful because they've they've been there um and they that's their whole focus is doing placement and so it people say well how hard can it be and I didn't think it would be that hard um but then uh I didn't I guess I didn't realize all the parts that go into it and so I love if I'm taking somebody to um a board and care home I can say, not only is this the owner, and this is why I like her, because you're going to be working with the owner very closely. I know Mm -hmm. that the owner has done this and this and this. I saw her take care of my uh, other client and did this and this. I saw her communication skills. And this is Angie, who's my favorite caregiver. (laughs) And I've seen Angie when someone was passing away, Angie wasn't there and she FaceTimed in to say goodbye to the loved one. And I'm like, that's the kind of caregiver I want to know. Well, you don't get that from a, you know, looking in the yellow pages or doing a quick Google search. You don't know all those stories. Um, But then on the flip side is it's also a free service. So um, the you don't play, a, most placement people don't take a fee from the family, but they receive a commission from the community. Um, but their job is to not go to just the communities that they're going to get the biggest commission from, but it's to find who's the best fit for your family. And I work with um, 
a new organization called the National Placement and Referrals Alliance. And um, they're in several states. I'm not sure if they're all in all of them, but um, we wrote down best practices that you should receive from a placement person so that they're really caring for you and your family and finding the best option for your loved one. What I did was I used a place for mom because somebody, a friend of mine had recommended it. So they did part of what you said, but I think because they weren't local, local, trying to remember where that guy was. I mean, he was in California, he was in Northern California, but he wasn't in Brentwood or Concord where my mom lived. And so I went to the places by myself. I think I called them. So he did like the first part of the work. Right. And what I wanted was someone to not do all the work (laughs) because you, you still as a family member, you make the decision and it's always your choice. But I wanted somebody to hold my hand. I wanted somebody to do the homework for me and to walk beside me through the process and, um, you know, and to check on me afterwards. How did it go? You know, if, if, uh, your loved one doesn't adjust well at the beginning. Um, you know, I had a client that just called me and I said, you know what, you know, I reminded her, usually this takes, you know, some people it takes two days, but some people it takes two months. And a local placement person is just kind of that ear that will listen and then give you feedback that this is normal. This isn't normal. This is going to be okay. Trust this. Oh, that's a concern. I don't know why that's happening. So you should have a care conference. You know, no one, a lot of times people don't know that they can call a care conference if things aren't going well at the beginning. And a a placement person, if a a transition isn't going well, they'll encourage you to talk to them and to start addressing that at the beginning and and walk you through that if you need it. So, Yeah, when we moved mom, like I said, the first two months were not fun at all. The executive director of the community told me it would probably take a month. I laughed at him because I figured it would never happen. So thankfully he was much more right than I was. And I've, I've said this story many times, but you'll get a kick out of it. You know, it'd been like six, seven weeks. I show up. My mom is following behind this much taller female resident. And my mom had a tendency to like clutch her hands to her chest. She always looked like she was worrying. (laughs) Maybe she was. And she spotted me and she goes, oh, come with me. I have to help my friend. And when I heard the word friend, friend. I almost burst into freaking tears. It was like somebody had said, you've won the jumbo national lottery. It was just, I was like, thank God it's going to be okay. And it really, really was because after that, you know, the people who follow me on social media, I post on Thursdays, throwback pictures. My mom started to hang. My mom's name was Diane. She started hanging out with other Diane. And at one point, I think they were hanging out together for about eight months. A third Diane became part of the group, oh. which was extremely confusing for yes. everybody. And so it was Diane, other Diane, and other, other Diane. Other, other. <laughs> yes. And my mom and the first Diane, I swear to God, they got into trouble all the time. We, um, after we rehomed the dog, there was a period of time where my mom had a six by eight um, area rug in her room and they, I went, showed up one day and it was missing. And I'm like, where the hell is a rug? You know, <laughs> like it didn't just walk away. And they're like, Oh, the dog soiled it. We took it out to clean it. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Well, like the next week it was still gone. I'm like, hello, what's going on? I'm like, Where's the rug? I could clean the rug. Yeah. I've had mm-hmm. dogs all my life. I, I unfortunately know how to take care of these kind of problems. Mm-hmm. And they're like, no, no, we got it handled. And so then my sister, who had happened to be going to Ikea, decided, you know, because it was starting to get to the cooler time of year. I say cooler because, you know, we're in Northern California. It doesn't get cold, cold compared mm-hmm. to some places like you guys. And she bought this really cute rug. It was like a cream background with plate size buttons as a design. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they were all different colors, black and purple and orange. And it was really cute. But unfortunately, it was five by seven. My sister didn't realize that it was smaller. So they brought the original rug back in. After we rehomed the dog, that rug was gross. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to get rid of it. 
And my husband scrubbed it and he's like, I don't, I wouldn't put this back in mom's room. So, so we, I put in the really super cute one that my sister had gotten and mom and other Diane, I swear they talked about it for an hour. I was first, it was hysterical that it was like, seriously, this is getting really old. But the mm-hmm. other Diane kept saying how great it would be as a wall hanging. I'm like, yeah, if you had a sewing room, it would be kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Next week I show up, rug is gone. <laughs> I'm like, what in the hell is with this room and rug right. disappearing? So I go over to the executive director or the memory care director. And I said, where the hell is the rug? And she goes, mm-hmm. are you kidding me? And I'm like, no. And so she goes, okay, when they go into dinner, we'll go into other Diane's room. And there was like a whole bunch of my mom's stuff in other Diane's room. <laughs> it was it's just awkward. It's just, I, they both had to have rolled it up and stuffed it in the corner of the other gal's room. Cause I mean, it was five by seven. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure the other Diane probably could have carried it just fine by herself, but it's, you know, they're bulky and they're awkward and right. You know, I, I would have really, I mean, there was times I really wish we'd had like the nanny cam or a nest camera because I was curious about things. I kind of wanted to make sure mom wasn't just sitting in a room by herself, but I found Uh out, I just asked them. So, cause they didn't allow cameras. But it was just crazy. But unfortunately, other Diane got really, really paranoid. Aww. I showed up one day and she's literally got like a, all of her clean laundry is in her lap and she's clutching it. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, knowing how they were, I said, who the heck dumped all of your laundry in your lap? Would you like some help? And I reach out to to to, you know, grab it from her and she jerked away and looked at me like I was going to like steal all her clothes. And I'm like, okay, if you want to hang on to your laundry. And about two months later, her daughters moved her out. So I don't know if Mm -hmm. she was becoming a problem or, Mm -hmm. you know, it was just, I never, I saw the daughters like one time. Cause like I said, Mm -hmm. I went Monday afternoons when other people like me were at work. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It was just, it was, it was an adventure and it was nice. Like I said, last week I went and saw, I went and delivered Halloween cards and, and little treats. So and, fun. Yeah, it was really nice. Although I think it's, it's kind of insane that they have the square dining tables separated by an X of plexiglass. I'm like, I really, mm-hmm. you have not had any COVID here. Mm-hmm. And now you've got these poor little ladies practically in like a little box. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Might be a little much, but, mm-hmm. you know. My maternal grandfather always said, we never get out of this life alive. So I'm a little bit more on the, you know, like my grandmother's board and care home. They let us in. They prefer you to Mm -hmm. wear masks. Grandma doesn't wear a mask. I have to take it off to talk to her because, like I said, she's very hard of hearing. Mm -hmm. And I already have to yell and wearing a mask means you just to yell twice as loud and Mm-hmm. I was not trained to scream at people as, mm-hmm. a, as a norm. So mm-hmm. do you have any last advice and encouraging words for caregivers like us? Well, more like you, my, I'm caregiver to the caregiver these days. That's, that's still caregiving. It's all caregiving. That is true. And it's um, important, you know, yeah. cause I'm here to support people and, you know, help them through the journey that you're on, that I was on, that other people will end up on, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Advice. Um, find people to support you. It's a very isolating job. That is true. Um, and, uh, you know, you feel lonely. You feel like <clears throat> a lot of times you're the only person going through this. No one understands what you're going through. Um, and it's, it's hard. And, Whenever you're lonely and isolated, which is ironic right now, to yeah. not isolate yourself, but it's just not a healthy place to be. Even if you're an introvert, you need other people and you need other people that understand your story and know what you're going through. So find your people, uh, reach out to them, find whether it's from the senior center on Facebook, find a Facebook group you like. Aging Parent Tribe is open to y'all, whether it's a, a friend, you know, our, our church put me in charge of seniors or elderly and, um, and we were doing gift baskets for people. And they said, now, is this for the senior or is it for the caregiver? And I said, oh, it's for the caregiver. <laughs> the caregiver needs to be loved on because they're loving on so many other people. That is so, true. um, I, I wanted to give something to them 
that was just for them and was a joy for them. Um, and and the when I brought that up to them, they said we just had no idea. We don't ever think of how the care ne- ne- the caregivers need to be loved on. So um, find your people wherever they are. There's people out there that understand. That is very true. Mm-hmm. Local Rotary clubs can help. My yeah, husband there's and I... Parkinson support group. There's Alzheimer's support groups. Um, you know, start there. That's a really great place to start. And those people know other things and use use them to network and find other people. I have a funny last story. You said Parkinson's group. Mm-hmm. I was at my Alzheimer's support group. The facilitator is a godsend on suggesting other support groups, other everything, classes, whatever mm-hmm. support she's aware of. Mm-hmm. I mean, she could spend like the first third of the meeting just telling us all this other stuff that's going on. Now she has to email us this pile of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was so excited. She had one flyer for a Parkinson's support group. Mm-hmm. And our neighbors down the street, her husband has Parkinson's. And I was so mm-hmm. excited. I'm like, oh, my neighbor's got Parkinson's and he's really tall and she's really petite. And I worry about them all the time. But I got my mom to worry about. And, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. and I said, can I please have the one flyer? And she goes, yeah, that's fine. I'm like, oh, thank you. Thank you. I was so excited. I go home and I'm literally holding the flyer going, honey, look, I found a support group for, for the, the neighbors down the street. And he goes, you need to look at that flyer closer. And I looked at the front and I went, oh, for the love of God, our neighbor was the one that started it. Oh. <laughs> I was so excited. That's I'm like, funny. yeah, I'm helping. And it was her group. <laughs> I was like, that's well, I tried. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, and I told her that story and she really appreciated it, but it was just, you know, That's so then so I gave funny. her the flyer. I'm like, well, here, you can have this one back and give it to somebody else. Well, and you know, um, assisted livings, especially right now are offering classes constantly, um, you know, for different support groups or Tipa Snow. I'm a huge mm-hmm. Tipa Snow fan. Um, I say she's my girl crush. Yeah. And, oh, yes. uh, and she's going to be on a virtual um, assisted living, you know, here in Denver. So looking at assisted livings is another great place to find resources, too, um, because they have a lot of classes that they're constantly offering. And, and they're usually open to the public, not just the people that live there or the families there. The Alzheimer's Association is doing all their classes virtual. Yeah. Which has been really great. I have a past guest who is a neuropsychologist. Mm -hmm. um brand new minted one of those wow and he is a person of color and Mm -hmm. we've talked about how alzheimer's affects people of color like double Mm -hmm. and the reasoning behind that is fascinating so you guys have to go listen to that episode if Mm -hmm. you're interested but they had classes that were specifically for people of color and so I forwarded him the email with the classes attached and I'm like pretty sure you probably don't have time to log into this he's in Utah so mm-hmm. they're an hour ahead of us. And I said, but, you know, maybe you can, if you're interested in what they're talking about, maybe you can um, see if they're going to record them. And he goes, well, mm-hmm. I hope to be able to be one of the speakers someday. And I'm like, well, you know, mm-hmm. I might be able to coordinate you with our chapter, which, you know, could maybe coordinate you with the chapter that's in Utah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, there's a lot of really good, I mean, the pandemic's been really good for people you know, sh- sharing stuff online. It's, it's been easier to find resources. Like there's ample amount right now, which is yeah. great. Yeah. Cause my Alzheimer's association chapter is about 40 minutes from here. Mm-hmm. And they always like to do stuff like right around lunchtime. And I'm like, that interferes with like my workout. I'd either mm-hmm. have to work out earlier or, you know, it's just like, I have to rearrange my schedule just to get to this class. And mm-hmm. now it's like, pfft, log Perfect. in and watch while I eat my lunch. You know, it's been really beneficial. So yes, you're right. There are tons of options. So I hope we've shared ways of finding them and definitely look, talk to a local placement person for resources and assistance. That was the best suggestion that Cameron gave today. So I really appreciate it. And I, I hope you and your family are doing okay during all this time with your mom. I know what advanced Alzheimer's is like. My mom had Alzheimer's for about 20 years. So hopefully your journey is a little shorter. 
Yeah. But I'm glad you guys are overachievers in that area. (laughs) Yeah. No kidding. (laughs) I didn't need to be an overachiever in that realm. So I really appreciate it. And if people need to get in touch with you, I'm linking the Facebook group in the show notes and you can get in touch with her that way. And do you want me to put your business in there too? GDPRA is a Uh-oh. great way to find a local placement I think we person. Lost or, sorry, NPRA. GDPRA is the Denver one. I'll give you the NPRA link to put in the notes, and that's a great way to find a local placement person that has agreed to work with a lot of okay. the best practices that I've talked about that are important. Um, and then my Facebook page is Aging Parent Tribe, or um, if you're in Colorado, awesome. and want, you need to help with finding a place, you can. Uh, look at my next step senior placement. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. And all that will be in the show notes and you guys can check it all out. All right. Thank you. Nice talking to you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.